Hello everyone and welcome back to The Analyst. Today is 1st of March and a good day to learn about the following 5 current affair articles. But before that, a gentle reminder to download the handout of this discussion from the description box below so that you can fully enjoy the session without being concerned about notes taking. So, in our first article, we will evaluate the need and challenges of semiconductor manufacturing industry in India as Cabinet has recently approved three fab units in Gujarat and Assam. Then, we will evaluate India-Mauritius relations in detail. In the third article, we will do editorial analysis about how to reduce cheating in exam and learn provisions of the Public Examinations Act of 2024. Then from prelims point of view, we will be covering two articles. In the first one, we will look into the status of leopard population in India and finally winding up the discussion with prison regulations of India. So let's get started. So what is our first topic? Our first topic is about the semiconductor manufacturing industry in India. So this is coming in the context of the Union Cabinet's recent approval of setting up three semiconductor fab units in two states of India two in Gujarat and one in Assam. So, Dholera and Sanand will be in Gujarat and the Morigao in Assam. This also makes Dholera the first ever full-fledged working fab unit to be constructed in India. On this note, we will start evaluating the semiconductor manufacturing industry in India. But first, let's start with the basics. What do you mean by semiconductors? Semiconductors are those materials which are not as good conductors as metals but also not absolute insulators like plastic. So we understand that semiconductors are those materials which have got their conductivity somewhere in between the metals and the non-metals. This is because of a specific quality of semiconductor where it only allows specific or a certain amount of electricity, controlled amount of electricity to pass through it only when certain conditions are fulfilled. So which means it becomes very very manageable to control the flow of current through these semiconductors even at very very minute level and also very precisely and therefore it is heavily used across multiple sectors in India today and not just in India across the world. So from your mobiles to the missile technology everything uses semiconductors and therefore it calls upon us to understand that there is immense demand of semiconductors across the world and so in India. So in summary if we want to read what are the specific need of establishing our our own indigenized semi semiconductor fab industry or manufacturing industry then what are the following points so the need is first of all that it is a driver of ICT age or the fourth industrial revolution now if you talk about the modern information and communication technology it is driven by some of the technologies like artificial intelligence they are going to be big data servers to handle huge amount of data there are going to be drones, there are going to be bots, there are going to be missiles, etc. And at the heart of all of them, what is the main driver? It is the semiconductor because semiconductor is prevalent in almost all these sectors, all these applications of the fourth industrial revolution. So if you want to drive fourth industrial revolution in your country, what would you be needing? You would be needing the brain and the heart of the future or the technological future that is the semiconductor. That is the first requirement. Second, there is immense geopolitical significance associated with semiconductors as well. Especially because semiconductors inputs, whatever is required, semiconductors are actually made up of silicon, germanium and even some compounds like gallium arsenide. So because the inputs are not available everywhere uniformly across the world and also because the manufacturing facilities are also not available everywhere equally. Therefore, it is a highly localized industry. So whoever holds the dominance in the semiconductor inputs and semiconductor processing and semiconductor products and would eventually hold the dominance over the politics of the world. Therefore, in other words, the politics created over semiconductor is also known as the silicon politic. This also leads to culmination of trade wars and aggressive acquisitions by different countries. You need to understand the disparity going on in the distribution. Most of the inputs that you have, that is for example silicon, germanium, gallium, arsenide etc. They are critical minerals who are heavily abundant only in China. 
So China has got majority of these resources. Then if you talk about the high-end manufacturing, then the high-end manufacturing technologies are only limited or in fact 100% situated in only two countries. One is Taiwan and the second is South Korea. So therefore, it is a heavily localized industry which is vulnerable to supply chain disruptions. And therefore, the country can put up their dominance. The country can create trade wars. Country can also show aggressive acquisition. Do you know one example what happened? That USA and and European Union, they stopped supplying their modern, modern semiconductor manufacturing technology to China. And in return, what happened? China stopped the supply of inputs like gallium, germanium, silicon, etc. to these two countries. This is again an instance of trade war. And in order to protect and isolate ourselves from such a trade vagary, we need to be self-reliant on semiconductor manufacturing. That's the second thing. Third thing is, India is heavily reliant on countries speci specifically like China and USA to bring up the semiconductor products and in fact semiconductor basic chips in India. Most of our industries are driven, we are a developing economy, we are continuously trying to engage more into our service sector, build ICT technologies. We need semiconductor in huge amount, but most of it is imported because we do not have any manufacturing facility yet. So therefore, we need to gain self-reliance. Then it is also very crucial for the strategic areas of the country. Strategic areas, which means satellite technology, your defense sector, your surveillance sector, etc. All of them would again be requiring semiconductor interventions in them and therefore in order to enhance our security and security infrastructure what do we need semiconductor again then it has a great multiplier effect over the economy you know that semiconductors are the one which drives the computers mobile phones gadgets etc so it heavily contributes in service sector then it also contributes in manufacturing sector it also now started contributing in the agricultural sector and then of course there is telecommunication sector and then there is satellite there is renewable energy all of them have got semiconductors at their core when we have enough amount of semiconductors with us it means that these industries will also start growing and if these industries grow which are already the core industries of India then eventually the Indian economy will also grow and therefore investing into semiconductor would have a huge multiplier effect in Indian economy now, once we understand that there is an immense need, then why are we not creating enough of them? What are the challenges pertaining to semiconductor manufacturing industry? See, first of all, it is a very expensive industry. If you want to set up an entire end-to-end -end supply chain, it would take somewhere about 10 million to 20 million dollar worth investment to create one particular industry. So it is first of all very very expensive. Second it is a very fragile very critical industry which is very very prone to things like dust or the temperature of the location or the industry or the factory and it is also it also needs pure water supply, clean water supply at all times. So the maintenance is also very high. The demand of maintenance is very high. So it is again a very critical very high maintenance industry also it gives you returns in longer runs because of high gestation period what is the time required to manufacture one fab or one chip it is at an average three to five years so in three to five years you will be able to create one fab or one chip so it is not only capital intensive but it is also something that is going to give you returns only in longer run now we understand that it is a very intensive industry when it comes to capital. It requires a lot of R&D, a lot of financial investment. But it is also power intensive because it requires power up to 24-7 at all the times. Otherwise, the factory would collapse. Then it is also skill intensive because it is led and it is driven at all the stages, at all the stages by only high skilled engineers and high skilled engineers who are continuously upgrading itself because this industry is also continuously evolving itself. So it is a very intensive industry. Then what happens? Investors are hesitant to enter the market. Why? Because first of all, it gives you returns in longer run. It, it has long gestation period. And second, because the industry is evolving in every second year because of the rapid growth of fourth industrial revolution. So it becomes very easy for a particular technology to become outdated very quickly when it comes to semiconductor industry. Therefore, investors don't generally enter the semiconductor market. Therefore, it again compromises with the capital that it requires to sustain.
then india is active only in the third stage so if you can see the third three stages the first stage requires designing of the integrated chip or the semiconductor chip also known as fab second would require manufacturing it using etching processes and then finally the end product integration end product integration would have assembly and packaging and testing india is very good in the third stage but it is over or it is under built or under developed in the in the first stage and in the second stage so india is only active in the third stage and its entry into the first two stages are also impeded by the factors that they are mostly dominated by usa we'll be analyzing it in the next slide but mostly because they are dominated by some countries like the eastern asian countries us and european union so it becomes very difficult for india to acquire ipr rights intellectual property rights in order to build a uh, unique designs and again to pursue manufacturing then it is again highly localized so therefore it has certain supply chain bottlenecks as well let's analyze it with the help of a supply chain diagram so a typical supply chain of semiconductor would look like that the first stage would be having designing now if you talk about the supply chain contribution of each stage then the first stage would would have contribution of somewhere about 15 to 20% of the total supply chain investment end product integration again 15 to 20% of the total contribution of supply chain and manufacturing which is the most capital intensive it requires it requires or it acquires the space of 30 to 45% of the total supply chain area when you talk about the design it is again very highly skill intensive it requires you to know technologies like computer aided design and also sde technologies so such technologies are not easily acquired and most of them also require unique iprs because new ideas new designs would also should be having ipr approvals so most of this is actually dominated by usa so it becomes quite difficult for india to enter into the designing stage and also we require certain capital government aided interventions in the form of capital that government provides us so that we can provide skills these skills to our people and they can finally venture into the design stage the second stage is the manufacturing the most capital intensive stage this requires investment of up to 10 billion dollars alone for setting up a particular industry if you talk about the manufacturing stage there are two facets of it first of all creation or manufacturing of high end chips and the low end chips if you talk about the volume low end chips are dominating the market but if you talk about which requires the most amount of capital and most amount of investment that is obviously the high end chip USA dominates in the high end chip so what is advisable for the india that if you want to venture into this capital intensive manufacturing center that is fabrication of the chips then we should be focusing investing or prioritizing the low end fabricating chips more and that is something that these particular plants are also trying to do so we are not going to venture into the high end chip manufacturing rather on the low end ones now you talk about the last stage in which india is already doing well so india can try to leverage and capitalize its workforce in order to perform more brilliantly in order to get more in infrastructure and also skill training in assembly testing and packaging of all these fabricated products so this is a typical supply chain and we also realize that there is heavy bottlenecks going on because the chain is heavily dominated by some of the players majority of them are in usa or european union or in the east asian nations the highest producer largest producer of uh, uh, your semiconductor is actually taiwan so then what are the government initiatives and way forward to take care of these challenges and to make india self reliant in semiconductors first and foremost we understand that this is capital intensive requires huge amount of capital so government for the first would be providing financial support in both the stages the first stage is a design stage so in order to provide investment in this design stage government has developed the design linked incentive scheme where government will try to provide 50% or carry up 50% of the total expenditure on the products or the semiconductors created by the indian industries then production linked incentive scheme this is to provide financial incentive to for the second stage so what this will do this will provide 4 to 6% of interest on every incremental sale on every incremental sale of the electronics or of the semiconductors that are produced 
or manufactured inside India. And with the help of this scheme only, government was able to attract giants like Vedanta and Foxconn. Now, we also need to develop a holistic ecosystem which is also sustainable in nature, which brings together all the end processes or all the following stages in one place. So for that, for developing that ecosystem, government has provided schemes like India Semiconductor Mission, where government will be providing an outlay of about 75,000 crore rupees for five years from 2020 to 2025 to develop a sustainable ecosystem. Then scheme for promotion of manufacturing of electronics component and semiconductors. Here, 25% of the subsidy will be provided for all the products or all the semiconductor chips that are created by the Indian industries. So again, this is to develop the ecosystem. Developing ecosystem and providing financial incentive is not enough. What we need to build is actually a prototype or a similar kind of example as that of Silicon Valley. So we need cluster based development where everybody come together, every stage come together and integrates itself. So for this electronics manufacturing cluster 2.2, is a uh, government step in the right direction where government will be trying to create a world class cluster in lines of Silicon Valley. And then we also need to attract the foreign investment by providing them capital support, skill support, also by uh, promoting or marketing our benefits, our leverages of what government is trying to provide and what potential Indian industry holds, Indian economy holds. So for that, there is a Semicon India Semicon India that is conducted on an annual basis by the government of India to promote the benefits of investing in India. Then we need collaborations because we need technological transfer, we need expertise transfer. So for that, some of the public sector enterprises, for example, Bharat Electronic Limited has been made to tie up with Intel as well as the tower supercomputers of Israel. And both of them together are trying to have technology transfer, which are given to the BEL so that we will be able to generate expertise in designing, manufacturing, as well as the ATP stage of the development. And finally, what we require, because this is a skill intensive sector as well. So we require people to be having advanced or delivered advanced training modules. And in lines of this, we need to reskill people, we need to upskill people. And a government initiative which takes care of this is a smart power skill program, skill development program by the Ministry of Electronics, where the aim is to reskill about 1 lakh technician by 2027 with the modern semiconductor manufacturing skills. So this is how we are going to roll out and also we are going to develop a robust semiconductor manufacturing setup in India. And now we will talk about the bilateral relations between India and an Indian Ocean Island, Mauritius. So we are going to evaluate this in context of the recently inaugurated airstrip and jetty by both these countries on the Agalaga Island. So first of all, let's understand it geographically. Where is Mauritius situated and where is this Agalaga Island situated? So first of all, all of them are a part of a broader series of islands, which is known as Mascarene Island. You must have read about Mascarene High, Mascarene High, which is responsible for driving out the monsoon towards Indian subcontinent. So the Mascarene High is or the Mascarene Islands are actually a group of islands located at the east of Madagascar and these islands are volcanic in nature. What are these islands? The Reunion Island, the Mauritius Island, the Agalega Island, all of these are examples of these Mascarene Island and all of them belongs to which country or which continent to Africa. So we understood this. Next, it is because it is one of the most affluent or very one among the very you know rich countries of Africa. So therefore, it is also a part of the common market of Eastern and Southern Africa, Comesa, which is actually a free trade area. In fact, the largest free trade area of Africa. So it is a part of the same. Then, if you talk about the population, two third of the Mauritian population is actually coming from the Indo-Pak origin. Why? Because back in your 18th and 19th century what happened that a mass migration happened from India towards Mauritius. Why? Because in the form of indentured labor, people were driven to serve in the sugar plantations. So a lot of people from India and the then India, Pakistan, they came 
and most of their descendants are living currently in Mauritius so it holds a lot of soft power and cultural ties for India. Then when you talk about religion more than 50% of them is Hindu and if you talk about the government it has got a similar history to that of India. They were also colonially ruled by British and they got independent in 1968 and currently they are working as parliamentary republic. So can we observe that there are a lot of commonalities with respect to India. So therefore, it becomes immense importance for us to deeply engage with Mauritius. Now let's evaluate the India-Mauritius relations, existing relations across different domains. So first of all, talking about the trade, do you know that Mauritius is the first African country with which India had a free trade kind of agreement in the name of CECPA, Comprehensive Economic Cooperation and Partnership Agreement, which liberalized the trade between the two countries and eventually making India the largest trading partner of Mauritius. That's the first thing. Second, if you talk about the health domain, then ever since the commencement of COVID, India has been a huge provider of humanitarian and medical aid to Mauritius. So we have provided thousands of consignments of COVID vaccines, essential medicines, and also led to the establishment of certain health infrastructure. For example, Jawaharlal Nehru Hospital and Subramanya Bharti Eye Center in Mauritius. Then, if you talk about the defense sector, then we have established a line of credit worth $100 million for the procurement of defense equipments from India. Lightweight helicopters like Dhruv have been a part of the same. Then, if you talk about infrastructural development, India has heavily contributed an investment in developing its social, economic and military infrastructure. So, first of all, there, were, there was a special economic package that was sanctioned from the end of India in order to support the following priority projects. These projects were the metro laying down the metro, in fact, Supreme Court building of there, the ENT hospital, social housing project which was applauded globally, then state of art civil services college, establishing a solar photovoltaic form. So, all of these are some of the priority areas in which India is providing financial aid. And not only that, India has also taken up the consignment of, of developing the Agalega Island. Now, if you talk about the Agalega Island, taking you back to the slide, it is somewhere here. It is to the west of Mauritius, but it is again a part of Mauritius only. And both of them are belongs to or both of them belongs to the Mascarene Islands. You should also remember the chronology or you know the pattern or the arrangement of multiple island countries. In the northern part we have Maldives and then we have got Madagascar in the southernmost part and there are other as well for example Chagos Island and the Ego Garcia and Assumption Island, Seychelles etc. So please remember the pattern because it can be asked in prelims. Now let's talk about the significance of establishing deep ties with Mauritius. First of all, we have got huge historical connect with them because 66% of their population has got descendants from India only. So we have got rich common cultural heritage, which is uh, common to both of us. Second, there is a strong strategic partnership which we expect from Mauritius. First of all, because of its strategic location in the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean, which has recently became a point of global spotlight. Everybody is trying to dominate over there and India should also participate rightfully so. So, India tries to therefore engage with Mauritius in order to first of all gain the strategic importance in the Indian Ocean. Second, deepening ties with our maritime neighbors like Mauritius is also one among our policy in one among our policy aims. And what is the name of that policy? The Sagar policy. So therefore, we need to engage with Mauritius at any cost. Second, it will also help us to counter China. China has already had multiple engagements with Mauritius where in 2015 it made it made an agreement of establishing special economic zones in Mauritius. So therefore now India is also trying to develop certain military bases and certain strategic locations in Mauritius in order to counter China. Then collaboration in common interest is also essential. The common interest would have maritime security, countering terrorism. So both of the countries can come together and work for the same. Then we can also have immense significance from Mauritius in the terms of economic side. If you talk about economic cooperation, I've already told that India is the largest trading partner of Mauritius. So that is why we have got a very good trade surplus with them. That is the first thing. And second, we can also collaborate on multiple common things which is very important for the future as well and for the climate change that is blue economy and renewable energy. 
and not only that interestingly because it is a part of africa it is also a gateway to investment and trade in africa so it can act as a bridge between india and the african continent to enable investment flow of investments in both among both the regions and therefore leading to regional integration now what are the challenges and what can be their new way forward first challenge is that trade imbalance is faced from the side of mauritius mauritius is highly trade deficit when it comes to trade with india if you talk about the statistics india provides india provides its goods worth 2 billion dollars while mauritius provides us goods versus goods worth 20 million dollars only so there is a huge trade deficit that is felt by the mauritius mauritian economy second mauritius is often viewed by india as a tax haven or a source or a route for round tripping and therefore india has now made more stricter amendments to the double taxation avoidance agreement with respect to mauritius and therefore now it has become a less lucrative less attractive investment destination that was initially coming from the indian side so now even in indian investments have gone little down when it comes to mauritius because of this amendment made by the indian government then there is geopolitical competition as well because china is already trying to take up multiple developmental projects including the agalega development project the special economic zone that i have already told and it is trying to set up military bases as well so there is global there is geopolitical competition that is faced next concerns about its potential military use this is concern coming from the mauritian side that whatever development india is trying to put forward is actually under the name of military establishment establishments so specifically when we talk about the agalega island the development project that is taken up is considered by some of the mauritian that this is one of the military bases that india is trying to incorporate here so there are certain concerns and threats some speculations on the same then how can we address them first of all let's address the trade imbalance how can we how can we fulfill that so first of all we need to encourage maldives to diversify their exports second first is diversification second is capacity building we can help them with technology transfer so that they can enhance their production capacity so that their industrial growth can enhance and they can export us more which can also help us uh, or help them to deal with the trade deficit situation that is the second thing and we can also provide certain goods from maldives preferential market access treatment if you give them the pma then they will be having or getting preferential or easy access to the indian economy then we need to reframe our economic cooperation we understand that we need to address the tax concerns related to mauritius but at the same time it is impeding the developmental aspects or the investments or the business partnerships that we used to have with them so while we are addressing this we should also try to move beyond the double taxation avoidance agreement and move towards more sustainable global and you know business partnerships then we also need to set up regional partnerships and work in both of them so for example the indian ocean rim association is something is one organization of which both the countries are a part of so they can collectively work over here so that we can effectively promote the trade and security in the border region and also in the indian ocean uh, all together last but not the least we also need to enhance the strategic cooperation with mauritius so that they do not feel dominated by our military so for that first of all we need to deepen cooperation in the maritime domain awareness we can have joint surveillance joint patrolling we can also have defense partnership by providing training equipments and capacity building to the mauritian defense forces as well and last but not the least we need to together come and forge a counter terrorism operation which can be helpful by fostering the intelligence sharing and collaboration to combat terrorism and specifically the ongoing piracy in the indian ocean region so as we understand that india has got deep stakes in indian ocean so deep engagement with mauritius is step in the right direction for us moving on to our third topic this is about the public examinations prevention of unfair means act that came on 12th of february 2024 and we are reading about this because it had it has been discussed in this editorial featured on the indian express and this is about how to reduce cheating in public examinations 
So first of all, let's understand what is this act about. So it is a kind of model legislation which is put forward by the central government in order to enhance the transparency, fairness and trust in the public examinations of India. And this is coming in the pretext of the revelations that high instances of paper leaking has happened in the public examinations over the last five years. So therefore, we'll be examining it. First of all, we'll examine the features of this particular act that came in the last month. So first of all, it gives the proper definition of two things. First of all, what do you mean by public examination and what do you mean by unfair means? So public examinations are those examinations conducted by public examinations authorities and those examinations in particularly, those authorities in particular, which are notified by the central government. Broadly, five have been notified. One is the UPSC, next is the SSC, then there is railway boards, and then there is IBPS for banking examination, and then there is your NET, your NTA. National Testing Agency. So any examination conducted by these five central government public examination agencies will be included under public examination. Next, what is the definition of unfair means? So unfair means is also they have created a list of about 15 of about 15 items which will be included under the unfair means and they will be they will be chargeable or they will be having certain punitive fines. So what are the, these punitive fines or what are the punishments? So they have broadly enlarged the punishments. First is that it has been made a cognizable offence, meaning that police can start the investigation without the due cognizance from district magistrate. The second thing is it is a non-bailable, which means that you will not be able to get the bail. And then second, it is now non-compoundable as well, which means that the complainant cannot take back the case, even if there has been certain agreement made between the accused and the complainant. Still, if the case has been promulgated, then it will stay in the court and it will not go without any trial. And also they have enlarged the punishment. Punishment up to three to five years in prison and also uh, a a feature of fine, fine up to 10 lakh rupees, but this is for students if they are caught performing any unfair means. But what if the service provider, what if the service provider has been found to be malfunctioning, then the charge or the penalty would be of about 1 crore rupees. Then investigation and enforcement provisions have also been there. Investigation and enforcement of these regulations will be made by an officer not below the rank of DSP or Assistant Commissioner of Police. Then this is a kind of model draft for the states to take lessons from and states can change them accordingly, modify them accordingly based on their own discretion. So currently this is only for the central government examinations and not for the state government examinations. They will be creating a tone on the basis of this model legislation. Finally, there is also creation of a high level national technical committee to take care of any technical malpractices that can happen in the online examinations. So this will be creating, this committee is responsible for creating protocols to take care of a foolproof IT system that conducts the examinations or the online examinations in India. Now, if you talk about the basic needs of this act and why do we need a revamp in the public examination system, the first thing is that there has been observed a huge frequency, a huge rise in the frequency of the number of question paper leaks, especially in the last five years. If you can observe from this data given over here, from 15 states, over 50 job recruitments, 41 over here, but 50 uh, is speculated job recruitment exams have leaked so for example for example the Rajasthan teacher recruitment test it was because of the paper leak it was postponed and then it was rescheduled for two times it also happened with the case of UP constable which only happened in 2024 and in the UP constable uh, in fact surprisingly this particular examination was taking place in the backdrop of this legislation being rolled out so it was in the bill stage and at the very same time the UP constable examination happened and the leak was released or revealed so heavy frequency of question paper leak can be observed. Now, this also makes us question the effectiveness of the existing state laws. There are multiple states, for example, in fact, UP has got stringent laws against cheating, punitive laws against cheating, but still we see a lot of leaks specifically in the state of UP and Bihar. Then, 
the be- the worst thing about it is the impact it has on the aspirants aspirants give all of their time money resources to prepare for these examinations ruthlessly and what happens if unfair means have been deployed the examination deems to be cancelled or at the max they are postponed it was seen in the case of haryana pcs where it was observed that due to paper leakage the entire result up till interview was declared null and it also impacts it takes a mental toll it takes a toll on the career of the students the time of the students so it has huge toll on the aspirants as well now we need more than just punishment is what this editorial wants to acknowledge we have got certain provisions of punishment in this particular act but just having punitive measures is not enough we also need to have certain preventive measures by making the entire examination system foolproof so increased penalties are insufficient it already exists in some states and still there are heavily paper leaking that is going on then we also need to address the root causes of the cheating and not just provide punishment for the same so what are these root causes first of all we need to acknowledge what is the attribute of a good examination system has also identified by this editorial a good examination system or a full proof system would be one where there is reliable valid objective and clear comprehensive creation of paper so the paper pattern first of all should not be having any ambiguity and it should be created on very objective lines second the process of conducting the examination should also be secured setting of paper then maintaining the secrecy related to the paper organizing proper centers and having proper audits of the centers is very very important these are certain very important preventive measures that you need to take care of if you need to create a full proof uh, or any errorless environment of examination in india then there also needs it all starts from schools it all starts from the educational centers actually where there should be a culture of academic integrity which is taught to the students or to the aspirants so that they realize that cheating would actually not uh, give them the right results that they want out of life it will not give them any kind of success which is worthwhile and finally addressing the underlying factors that incentivize cheating there are certain factors which do so first of all a craze about cracking the examination the societal pressure the edu- educational anxiety to get first rank in the examination sometimes without even working hard so the underlying factors they should also be addressed holistically and then we need to address the limitations of the online examinations because the online systems are also found to be prone to hacking and cyber crimes which can also lead to manipulation of results this was also seen in the case of a test paper happened with airport authority of india the entire examination was manipulated and many again many so so these are the root causes which needs to be dealt comprehensively so then what can we do about it first of all we need to reduce the exam weightage examinations as such are not the best judge of a person's capability it has been told to us time and again but because of the structural faults in the systems we fall victim to it but because of the structural problems with the system we become a victim of it so it should not be the sole selection criteria rather the criteria should be a holistic assessment of the aspirant as to how much work experience a person has what are the co curricular activities what are the holistic performance or consistent academic record of that particular aspirant these should be the larger factors which should be taken into account then we should focus on innovation pedagogical methods for example promoting startups for example promoting cultures which are project based or model based or internship based rather than getting on to this thing of cracking the exam and creating desperation of the same finally strengthen exam security measures by we can do multiple measures for the same we can employ secure printing we can have online examination with robust infrastructure digital infrastructure which is very very secure we can have strict investigation protocols as well so this is how we can ensure that at the infrastructural level and at the security level we are strengthening the examination system the overall examination system and last but not the least one more recommendation is there that we need special investigation agency which is impartial in nature and which can create independent audits independent audits and strict invigilations across the examination halls and this is how we will be able to truly reward our rightfully or deserving candidates of the country and now from prelims point of view we'll be learning about the leopard population in india what is the context it recently a report of ministry of forest has said that india's leopard population has risen up to 8% 
so previously it was somewhere about 12,000 and now it has jumped on to 13,000 in population and which state ranks the highest in the number of cheetah population it is the same which ranks first in tiger population this is Madhya Pradesh okay first of all let's learn about some of the facts on leopards so first of all you should be very you should be very happy about this news that India is the only country in the world to boost the five big cat species the lion the Indian leopard the tiger the clouded leopard and the snow leopard in fact all the three species of leopards in India then it is near threatened the Indian leopard that we are talking about it is near threatened and one of the important facts of Indian leopard is that it is highly territorial so if it occupies the same area as that of tiger it will tend to occupy nearly double the area as that occupied by tiger in the same region because they are highly territorial and because they can also live in very adverse conditions they do not require a lot of water to survive and they can also climb trees and they are also somebody who can have speed gain speed up to 60 kmph they are also one unique fact about the leopards is that all they are, although they are classified as roaring cats but they usually bark whenever they have something to say. The spots are not known as cheetal as that for cheetah. It is known as rosettes because it looks like roses. And what are black panthers? Black panthers are nothing but leopards with a particular disease known as melanism, wherein the entire coat becomes heavy with the pigment or the coloration of melanin. Now, if you talk about the counting of leopards in India, it can be broadly found in three different different regions. These three regions can be classified as the Shivalik, Central India and Western Ghat. As you can see that the population is heavily concentrated in the Central Asia region. In the Central Asia region only you will see Madhya Pradesh and I think it has been hidden from here but Madhya Pradesh hosts the largest amount of cheetah pop of leopard population of about 3000 leopard populations today. And if you talk about the 1000ers, which means the states which have got leopard population more than 1000, then that is Maharashtra, that is Karnataka and that is Tamil Nadu. You also need to remember this. Then the least they are found in some of the states like Goa and Bihar. That's not very important. You need to remember MP and you need to remember the 1000ers. Okay, now let's have a quick comparative and the big cat analysis among all the species that are there in India. We are going to compare cheetah, lion, leopard and tiger. First of all, their conservation status. The IOCN status says that the highest vulnerability or the highest endangered species is tiger among them. And then there is leopard and then there is lion which is vulnerable and cheetah again which is vulnerable. Cheetah is extinct in India but not in the world. So if you talk about the world status of cheetah, it is vulnerable. Now the scientific name you can read from here. Then what is their native range? So except for tiger, except for tiger which is only found in Asia, all the others can be found in Africa and Asia. Then the highest speed, highest speed could be said for cheetah. Then their physical characteristics. So first of all, when you talk about tiger, tiger has got, tiger is the largest of all of them and it has got dark stripes on orange furs. It has also got unique vertical strips. Then if you talk about the cheetah, cheetah is generally light built. If you talk about lion, has a muscular body and if you talk about leopard, it is more powerful and it is more muscular. Then what are the coat pattern? You need, don't need to remember everything, uh, all the coat patterns, but you need to know that the rosetted coat pattern is showcased by leopards and there are spots in the lions which disappear over time. So this is also something we can remember. Then let's talk about their social behavior, whether they are solitary or whether they like to live in pride or in group. So tigers are solitary hunters and leopards are also predominantly solitary with having by, by having large large territories but when it comes to lion and cheetah they, they prefer to live in pride so this is a big cat analysis among all the cats that we have in india and now the last topic of the day where we will be assessing the prison regulations in india what is the context that recently union government has warned states over discrimination against prisoners based on their caste and religion and they have also warned that the existing regulations and the model prison act that we are going to read about both of them does not allow or has any 
uh, any particular regulations with regard to this discrimination. So they do not, in fact, they prohibit discrimination on any such grounds. So now let's analyze the regulations available for prison regulation in India. So now let's analyze the regulations which are there for prisons in India. So first of all, prisons or persons detained in the prisons are actually a part of state subject. So they are incorporated in the second list of Schedule 7 of Indian Constitution. The regulations that drive them, the regulation that drive the prisons and the prisoners detained in them are first of all, the first ever but the Colonial Act, the Prisons Act of 1894. First of all, you need to remember that it is the mandate of a state government to take care of the management and the administration of, this, of the prisons which are there in each and every particular state. But at the same time, central government can also contribute by creating a model act. So a model prisons act has been created in 2023 and that is when UPSC in the prelims examination also asked a question on this act. So model prisons act is, has been created as a model law by the central government which can be followed up by different state governments according to their own modifications and discretions. And then there are respective manuals which are created by individual state government departments as well. So these are the three regulations which drive the prisons in India. And what are some of the initiatives that takes care of the reforms in prisons in India? So first of all, a committee was set up by central government to recommend some of the reforms for improvement of the condition, prison inmates and the prisons in India. Its name was Amitav Roy Committee. Amitav Roy Committee. And it gave multiple recommendations. Some of them have been incorporated. Let's analyze few. So first of all, Indian government in 2002 promulgated the modernization of prison scheme by establishing digital infrastructure so as to improve the conditions of the prisons, the prison inmates and the prison personals. Then there was a scheme which gave the financial grant in order to modernize the prisons in India. Its name was Modernization of Prisons Project and it was from 2021 to 2026, a five-year project. Then there was e-prisons project and again in order to digitize, digitize the processes of prisons in India so as to bring transparency and efficiency in their working. And then there was model prison manual that was created again by the central government which would provide detailed information to all the prisoners regarding their entitlements living in the prison or certain free legal services that they were entitled to. And finally, there was also establishment of NALSA, National Legal Services Authority under the Legal Services Authority Act of 1987 which said that there will be free and competent legal entitlement to the weaker sections or to those prisoners who are belonging to the weaker sections of the society. So this was about the prison regulations ongoing in India. Now, if you try to solve this PYQ given in 2023, let's try to solve it together. First of all, there are two statements given. First says, in India, prisons are managed by state government with their own rules and regulation for day-to-day -day administration for prisons. So we've already read that prisons and subsequent things are state subject itself. So this statement is correct. Second statement says that in India, prisons are governed by the Prison Act 1894. This statement is again correct. We have just now read, which expressly kept the subject of prisons in the control of provincial government. Provincial government at the time of colonial India corresponded to the present time state government only. If today is a part of today it's a part of state list, then erstwhile also it would have been a part of provincial government only. So therefore, in this case, both the statements are correct. So this was all about today's reading. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you have gained something from it. Thank you so much for your time. Till we meet again.